Welcome to the Reader Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm your host, Corey Graham. Join us here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where the independent new authors come first. When it tastes good, it's done. Manja. That's the name of the new book. It's out there in stores right now, written by John Trey Montana. And John is right here with me now, and I get to find out more about this book. John, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be uh, sharing this time with you this evening. Thank you. Well, the pleasure's all mine, John. I, I can't wait to find out about this book. When it tastes good, it's done. Manja, uh, what's this one all about? Well, you know, it's a cookbook that I put together. I assimilated recipes from my grandmother and my mother. I was a chef in a restaurant, my restaurant, for 10 years, and I learned a lot cooking for all my friends when I was doing that. But just a combination of all these recipes that I've learned through the years and what I wanted to do initially was to put this down on paper. All the recipes that my grandmother gave me were never written down. So when I cooked with her, you know, it's a pinch of this and a little of this and a handful of this. <laughs> and we're cooking. And I said, Nana, I said, it's done. And she goes, when it tastes good, it's done. And that's where the name from the book comes. Uh, can you think of what that spark was, what that motivation was for you to say, hey, I'm, I'm going to collect all these recipes. I got to get this thing published. Was there a specific inspiration? Well, I tell you, there's some people in my family, my uncle's wives, that wanted the recipes for their kids. And you, know, you must have all Dana's recipes written down. Can you just share them with us? And I said, hmm. Dana never wrote anything down. <laughs> so I went through and I took all these pinches and handfuls and a little of this and a little of that. I made all the recipes and I weighed all the spices beforehand and weighed them after and figured out what a teaspoon weighed and what a tablespoon <laughs> weighed and put them all together so I could do it for my family. The initial idea for this book was just to be documentation of my grandmother's recipes for my family. And what happened was, uh, you know, I was getting last Christmas, I guess, so I was getting ready to send it out to everybody. And I had my wife and two of my neighbors said, no, you can't do that. You, you've got to you publish this. I said, nobody is going to publish this book that I put together with these recipes. And you no, know, I sent it in. I said, look, okay, let me find someone who might do this. Let me do it. But when they give me the red X, when it comes back, then let me send it out to my family so they'll have what they asked me for. And I did that at two, it was like, I don't know, maybe a week, and I got a phone call to say, we need to publish your book. I was fucked. I worked out, so that truly was. Mm. It was crazy. Uh, John, what skill level of cook or chef do you have to be in the kitchen to be able to pull off some of these recipes? Well, you don't have to be very good. There's no extraordinary culinary expertise you need to have. I mean, you need to how to eat out of sake, and you need how to, well, you know, fry. And, but generally, you can take all these recipes, and you can do them all in, in 10 or 15 minutes. Hmm. And that's what's so good about this is because when I used it in my restaurant, you know, you do a little prep work, obviously, but you can take it out of the refrigerator. You can take a veal cutlet or a chicken cutlet that you prep beforehand. And in 15 minutes, you can have veal parm or chicken parm or chicken cacciatore, whatever you want in that 10 or 15 minutes. It's an excellent book for people just learning to cook or people who are new to cooking for two people, like newlyweds is good for, and for college kids that just get out of college and they're starting on their own and they want to know how to cook authentic Italian, this book will teach them how to do that. Mm, fantastic. How long of a process was this for you, John, to collect all these recipes, format them in a the book, and get it published? Well, I guess, you know, it only took me about four months to get it published, but it took me a little bit longer than that because I had all the, you know, I just had to get it edited. I had it all written down, and I sent that all in, and to edit it wasn't too bad, but to make all the recipes and to uh, weigh everything out and get all the right combinations of spices, it probably took three months. So maybe it took seven or eight months from start to finish to get the entire book together. And this is a personal thing for you, John. You talked about this was primarily for you and your family to enjoy. So what was it like that day that it finally came in and you finally got to hold this book for the first time? It was absolutely amazing. It really was an incredible experience. It truly was. 
I think a lot of people out there are going to enjoy this book and learn an awful lot about some really good recipes and some really good cooking here. I encourage my listeners to check this one out. Again, it's titled, When It Tastes Good, It's Done. Mangia. It's written by John Trey Montana and is published by Newman Springs Publishing, so it's available anywhere. Go on over to Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or traditional brick-and-mortar stores and you can pick this up. John, thanks again for coming on the Reader House Author Roundtable telling me all about this delicious-sounding cookbook. I had a good time. It was very enjoyable, and I really enjoyed our time together. Thank you, sir, very much. There's an exciting new audio book out there. It's called Moon People, The Journals of Lordaya. It's written by Dixon Troyer, published by the Audiobook Network, and I'm going to find out all about this audiobook. The author, Dixon, is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Dixon, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Corey. I appreciate being here. And I got to give you a point. You actually said Lordaya's name correctly, as in the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Dixon, can you tell me about this book? It sounds exciting. You know, the book is has it's loaded with conspiracy theories. And my whole mm. idea is to open up people's eyes. I went through this whole search for religion search for truth, and no one ever had any answers. They just said, oh, just have faith, just have faith. And then all of a sudden, I start finding all these mysteries out there that maybe aliens came to the other, uh, they came from another planet to here. And this all started, oh, a couple of decades ago. If you replace the word light in the Bible with faith yet, it makes more sense. A light came from the sky and out walked the angels. Well, if you and I were traveling to the time of Moses and we had just a big lighter and a flashlight, we would be God. So mm. I started from there and I opened up the book from there more and more. And really, my wish with this book is for people to look up these conspiracy theories. And I have them in there as Easter eggs. So everything in that is connected. The moon is a spaceship. Adam and Eve was growing by slaves, by a race that's documented in the Sumerian scriptures, the Anunnaki, out from Nebiru, came here to mine gold to save their atmosphere with their own planet. And I just put it into a fictional story to have fun with it, a Lordaya, the father telling his daughter when he reunites with her. And he did grow them in his own image, Lordaya did, thus the name Lord. Hmm, very interesting. Dixon, what kind of readers do you think would really be into this? Did you have a reading audience in mind? Yeah, you know, it's coming off as a sci-fi book just because the moon being a spaceship, we travel back into time. So we go back to the time of Adam and Eve, the time of Moses, the time of Noah's Ark, that uh, it's going to be a sci-fi piece. Hmm. I didn't mean it to be. It just kind of turned out, out that way. How long of a process was this for you from when you first got this idea, started writing it up until it's published and out there? You know, I came up with it about 10 to 15 years ago, and it took me that long to sit down and, and write it. The year 2020, I sat down and wrote it. It took me about three months to write. And then since this was my first book, it took me a lot longer to edit it and learn how to write a book properly. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's like, you have to learn by doing, I guess. So I was like, no, it did change night and day. And from where I am today as a writer to when I started, it's a whole nother journey. Well, congratulations on getting your first book out there, Dixon. That's a huge accomplishment. And I'm sure you learned an awful lot along the way of doing this for the first time. Do you have advice that you could throw out there now for aspiring authors? You know, if you want to be a writer, I was told for years that I couldn't write because it's not like I'm Mr. English here. But I found out that there's people that have ideas and we need people that are editors. And a lot of times editors don't have the ideas. So if you want to write, sit down and write and make it an hour a day. And that's what I do now. And that's what I did. I sat down and wrote an hour every day. And it became almost a Zen process for me. And next thing I know, I had a book, 70,000 words. Wow. Of course, we're talking about the audiobook edition. Uh, Dixon, was that a big jump, you actually hearing your book as opposed to reading it? Yeah, it was amazing to be able to hear that. And the author that did it, he did a fabulous job putting it together. And it is nice to hear that. Seeing the cover, I, I think the two big things is having the book in your hand and filling it and looking at the cover and then hearing the audio book as well, too. Mm. Those are two big phases that really open up your heart and make you happy. 
Well, I love the creativity here. I love that it's about conspiracy theories, and it's all woven in here. And I think readers are going to love this, and listeners, in this case, to the audiobook. Again, it's titled Moon People, The Journals of Lordaya. It's written by Dixon Troyer, published by the Audiobook Network. So get it anywhere that you pick up audiobooks, like on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or at Amazon. Well, Dixon, thanks again for telling me all about Moon People and everything that you were doing. I had a nice time talking with you tonight. Thank you, Corey, for having me. It was a pleasure, and I enjoyed talking to you. Everyone is a someone, featuring the 2020 pandemic COVID-19. That's the name of the new audio book, written by Roy Murch and Robin Frost. And I get to find out all about this. The co-authors are here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Roy, Robin, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you for having us. The pleasure's all mine. I'm curious about this audio book. Everyone is a someone. Could you tell me what this is all about? Well, you know, everybody's life matters. Mm. And during this pandemic and everything, that there was so many people that brought in hate and just threw away all the love. And we wanted to kind of unite people back together and show that everybody's life matters mm -hmm. and that everyone can be a somebody you know, and everybody counts. Yeah, unity certainly is a message that I think everybody needs to hear right now. It's just gone pretty crazy. My input is united we stand, divided we fall. I'm putting that on my wall, outside, on a mule. I'm serious I have a person that's going to do it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's so important for everybody to quit the hate. Absolutely. How long of an endeavor was this uh, once you started writing it, clear up until the audiobook got out? Well, it took me three years to write it, and the reason why is because I didn't want to put out any misinformation or false information. Mm -hmm. I wanted everything that I put in this book to be backtracked and true information. I didn't want to write a lot of stuff that people can't believe. And if it was an article, a newspaper article, I wrote down the newspaper, and I also wrote down the editor that wrote the article so that anything in here is backtracked in its true statements. That's important. So when it came to the co-authoring relationship, how did that work? Roy, you just said, you know, you wrote a lot of it. And Robin, what was your role in this? Well, I did a lot of the playback. And Roy's well, not really the best seller in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> Robin, how do you spell? You know, so, no, we were both really upset about the whole situation. Mm. I don't have any hate in my heart, but I really do not appreciate the way things were going at that particular time. Well, there was so much racial injustice. My goodness, it almost started the Civil War. And so close to losing our democracy, I felt I had to say something to bring back the love and get rid of all this hate that the people were feeling around the world. Roy, when you were writing this, did you have a specific group of people in mind, or was this just a really general kind of thing? Well, you know, I was talking to mostly the middle class people, and the reason why is because they do all the living and dying, and they do all the voting. Mm. The book is written simple, in simple language, so that everybody, no matter what educational yeah. status that they are, they can understand the book. Mm. And that's the reason why I wrote it, for everybody to understand. When it comes to writing, being published, and all of that, are you too experienced in this, or are you new? I would never thought about writing the book, and believe it or not, this is the hardest thing I ever did, to write the book and then edit it myself, and do all the punctuation and everything else myself. The reason why I didn't have a computer, when I got back and I finally got into the computer and started reading again, I got where I couldn't hardly uh, read, or I forgot so much. And this there kind of re-educated me getting back into the computer and everything was happening. Robin having confidence, her and her family having confidence in my poetry that I wrote. Roy, you wrote two other books prior to. And they're all about mental health. Because when I got out of the service, so many people in the military were dying. 22 a day and over 100,000 homeless. Wow. This really affected me because nobody ever said anything on this about helping the veterans. So this was one thing I decided that my Vietnam story, because I have PTSD, mental health myself, would help other people tell their stories, which will help them, their demons that they feel inside. Well, it's all about unity. It's all about coming together after these really hard times that we've been through. And I really love the message that's in this audio book. And 
I encourage everyone out there to seek out this title. Again, it's titled Everyone is a Someone, featuring the 2020 pandemic COVID-19. It's written by Roy Murch and Raman Frost, and it's published by the Audiobook Network, so you can get it everywhere, Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, everywhere you go to pick up your audiobooks. Well, Roy and Robin had a wonderful time speaking with you both here tonight, and I hope we get to talk again. Yes, we appreciate that. And thank yes, you for that, that was a very nice, good time. Thank you very much, hon. Thank you very much. There's a new audio book just came out written by Art Steele. It's titled Poison Ivy, and we're going to talk all about this here at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Art is here with me. Art, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. It's really exciting when the audiobook version of this book comes out, Poison Ivy. So, Art, can you tell me what readers can expect in Poison Ivy? Well, they can expect to go back to the 1970s. <laughs> Most of them probably won't remember it, but it's a story about then in the military, and being in the military then was much different than it is now. Mm. What inspired you to write this story? What gave you that idea, Art? Well... I was getting medical treatment through the Veterans Administration, and they diagnosed me with having PTSD, and one of the counselors that I had counseling with suggested that I should write a book. After we talked for about three months' worth of counseling once a week, she finally said, you know what, I think the only way you're going to get past this is to write it all down, and you might as well write a book. So I did. And how long of a process was that for you when you sat down, started writing it clear up until the audiobook even came out? Well, I retired back from my regular job back in August of 2020. By January of 2022, I started writing the book, and within a year, well, less than a year, it was published, and then it's been about now another six, eight months that we've been working on the audio audiobook version. It took me about 10 months of actual writing after I retired to get it all down. We're talking about that audio book art, and what was it like to actually hear your book as opposed to just reading those words off the page? It was a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a lot different, and I will say that I do believe that the narrator did an excellent job because lots of times when I was listening to it, I couldn't really tell if it was me or him talking, so oh, wow. he really did a great job. Art, what did you find the most challenging part about writing, publishing, producing the audiobook? Was there any part that you felt was particularly difficult for you? Not the audiobook part. They did pretty much everything for me. They just sent me, you know, what they had. They sent me first three different potential narrators, and I listened to their short blurbs that they all sent me, and I picked the one that I did. And then from there, it was just mostly waiting while they did all the work, and then I just had to approve it when they were done with it. Mm. Like I said, we're talking about the audiobook, but before the audiobook comes the hard copy. And Art, what was that day like when you got to hold that hard copy for the first time? Yeah, it was quite, I would say, almost shocking, because I, even though I knew it was going to be published and everything, when, it, when they delivered me my free copies of the book, I picked it up, opened up the cart, and picked up the book, and it was like it was a whole different world because I never thought that I would ever, anyone would ever want to read what I had <laughs> put down <laughs> in wood. I will say that one of the things, or one of the things I liked about doing the audio book is I do have a first cousin who was born blind and not out in Braille or anything, so I want him to be able to listen to the book. I'm sending him a free copy of it just so he's got his own personal version there. Well, that's fantastic, Art. And it was very wise of you to go the audiobook route with this because you're right, you're opening up so much more of an audience. You know, people with disabilities who maybe aren't able to read, they can listen to your book and they're going to be able to enjoy it just as well as anybody else. Right. And plus the fact I know a lot of people who won't sit down and, you know, read a book, but they will definitely listen to one. You know, it's less work, I guess. It's such a busy world. Everybody wants to get everything done as quickly as they can. So so what are you working on now, Art? Are you doing more writing, more publishing? I am currently in the middle of, well, I've got one children's book that I've got a granddaughter who's going to do the illustrations for me. Oh. So I sent her all that stuff. So she's going to do some illustrations. Then I'm going to look for someone to publish that. I'm in the middle of two other books that I'm about halfway through with, both totally different subjects. And 
I get about halfway through them, and then I have to sit back and rest for a while. So last time I sat back from writing one of them, I decided to write another. <laughs> well, I think readers and listeners in this case are also going to love this book and think they ought to check it out. Again, it's titled Poison Ivy. It's written by Art Steele. It's published by the Audiobook Network, so get it anywhere that you pick up your audiobooks, like on Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, everywhere. Well, Art, I really appreciate you coming on the show and chatting with me here about Poison Ivy. I had a really nice time. I did too. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Right now at the Reader House Author Roundtable, we're going to talk about a book that looks to guide believers to grow in their faith as they walk through the Bible. It's titled, Chairside Chats with God, a one-year daily devotional. It's written by Robert R. Edwards, and Robert is right here with me now, and we're going to talk all about this book. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me, Corey. I appreciate your time, Robert. Can you tell me all about this devotional, Chairside Chats with God? Well, this actually began as a challenge that I had with a young man who was kind of struggling in his faith. And asked him if he was reading his Bible every day. He said that he did before, which I believed in. And he said he just wasn't getting much out of it. Mm. So I said, why don't you read the same thing I am? I'll text you a verse or two that speaks to me. You text a verse or two back. And we started doing that. Within a few months, he really started to grow in his faith again. Not just reading the Bible, but reading it with intention to try to hear what God was speaking and saying to him. And then it kind of grew from there and included some others. And during COVID, we started posting these online. And that became the material for the book mm-hmm. and decided to put it in a written form. How long of an endeavor was it for you from when you first started working on it, writing it, and clear up until it was published? Well, last year in 2022 was where most of the devotions come from. And so in January, I started submitting book proposals and ended up with Covenant Books, and they took the book to print, and oh well, March, we just then really started compiling everything, getting it together, and they actually did a great job getting it in print within about six months. Hmm. And then once you got it in print, you actually got to hold your book for the first time, Robert. <laughs> what kind of moment was that for you? Well, it was kind of a surreal moment, just mm-hmm. wondering if everything needed to be done, which obviously it's not, because it's only got to promote the book and distribute the book Mm -hmm. and try to advertise the book and just help people understand why this is a little different. It's not like most other devotional books. This tracks along with a daily Bible reading plan. And I tell people, if you only have time to read one thing, read your Bible. I would prefer you to read that. This just helps focus and show how a couple of verses each day can be impactful and meaningful if we're reading with the intent of listening for God's voice with what we're reading through. Robert, when it comes to writing books, being published and all that, are you new to this or have you done it before? I am new. This is the first book that I've put into print. It's kind of a self-confidence issue, but I already have plans for two as follow-ups with this. They won't be devotional books, but I have the material for two that I'm working on following this. So it really was just a process of getting a confidence that I could put in the print something that actually would be helpful and meaningful to people. Now that you've done this, Robert, do you have any advice, anything you picked up along the way that you could throw out there for aspiring authors? I would say that for first-time authors, it's a very difficult process to get your book into print unless you're going to look at either self-publishing or a hybrid publisher. And one of the things that I learned was that without much of a digital presence, if you don't have a number of Twitter or X followers now or Instagram followers, oftentimes traditional publishing houses won't even really consider your book, Mm. regardless of the content or the material that you're proposing. It's a process, and it does take an investment on the part of the author. So new authors ought to be prepared for that. And since this is my first book, I really can't speak to others who would use more traditional means, but that's something that we discovered in the process. Hmm, Good advice. Robert, when you think about chairside chats with God, is this a book you would say primarily is for believers, or do you think non-believers would get something from it too? Well, I think that it's both. And in fact, several of the people who have purchased the book have given it to their non-believing friends. It's interesting the response that some of those who pick it up and have started reading. It's just a way for people to engage with Scripture to hear what God may be saying. 
Well, I'm confident this book is going to really help a lot of people grow in their faith and also learn about the Bible, have a good solid reading plan for the Bible. Again, this is titled Chairside Chats with God, a one-year daily devotional written by Robert R. Edwards and published by Covenant Books. So you can get it anywhere like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, also down the street at your local bookshop. Robert, thank you again for talking with me here tonight and telling me about Chairside Chats with God. I had a nice time. Well, thank you, Corey. I appreciate your time. Sitting down right next to me here at the Reader House Author Roundtable is author Reverend Dr. John Papachan. John, welcome to the show. I really appreciate you being here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Well, the pleasure's all mine. I wanted to congratulate you. You have a new audiobook out titled Christian Paradigm. John, can you tell me what this is all about? Yes, the book is focusing on the uh, fundamental principles and uh, basic Christian behavior. It's an attempt to portray that, you know, what is Christianity and how should a Christian lifestyle should be, things like that. What gave you the idea to write this? What was your inspiration for this? Well, I have been all around the world. I have seen people following Christianity as a ritual thing without understanding the implications of Bible or its principles and Christianity in their life. So just thinking like just any other religion, Christianity in it is a little deeper than that. It's just not a religion. It's a lifestyle. How long did it take you to write this and have it published and have the audiobook produced? The book took me about 14 months to write them. The book was published early this year, around February. And the audio book took only about a couple of months' time. Hmm. And when it comes to writing and being published, everything like that, are you new to this or have you done it before? I haven't completed the book before, but I now return materials, uh, textbooks, portions, and things like that. And, of course, we're talking about the audiobook edition here, but you did say last February this came out in the hard copy. What was it like when you finally got to first hold this hard copy in your hands? It was a pleasure. It was like, you know, a symbol of accomplishing something, Mm. which uh, we never had before. And considering all of that, John, now what's the most rewarding aspect to you of being a published author now? Well, it is the ability to spread your thought process also God's word to the apostolic people so that you can communicate with them. And it's the ability to convey your thought process, your understanding into different people of different places, different in the world and languages. Actually, the book is being translated a couple other languages now. Hmm. And John, do you think we can expect to see more published by you in the future? Yeah. So well, I was writing, actually, the book I had to go through a lot of Bible articles and things like that. Mm. It surely did give me a little bit of self-edification that I myself could be a little closer in my walk with Jesus. And when you do go to write, John, uh, do you have a routine? Like maybe you sit down early in the morning or late at night, or, or maybe you're like some of us that just writes whenever the ideas and the time are there. Actually, most of this book was written in airplane. Oh, wow. Well, I was traveling. <laughs> and also, I used to some weekends and some other time. Number of some, I would say about 50% of the book was written in while traveling and the other was at home. I'm sure you learned an awful lot along the way of doing this for the first time. So do you have any advice that you could toss out there for the aspiring authors who are listening? Yes, if we have a message that we strongly and honestly believe in our heart that should be Make known to other people, don't be shy to write it up, write it up. But when we write things, you know, we must also understand that we are writing it to make our stand clear to other people, not necessarily just for profit alone, because every book may not bring a fortune, you know. That's good advice. And when you think about the publishing end of things, there's so much involved in that, John. What did you find the most challenging part of that? Oh, to me, it was, you know, just uh, reading over and over and making sure that I actually conveying what I want to convey, and that was the bigger part of it after finishing the first draft. And talking about the audiobook edition of this, what was it like for you to actually hear your book as opposed to reading it off the page? Yeah, I did hear the whole book, and it's really giving me some energy, some, some vector that persuades me to continue to listen. 
Well, I think there are a lot of people out there that are going to be blessed by this audio book, and I think you ought to go check it out. Again, the title is Christian Paradigm. It's written by Reverend Dr. John Popachan, and it's published by the Audiobook Network. So go on over to Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, and you can get this book really anywhere that you pick up your audiobooks. Well, John, thank you again for coming on the Reader House Author Roundtable and telling me all about Christian Paradigm. I had a nice time chatting with you. Oh, thank you very much. For your time, thank you. I'm sitting down here at the Reader House Author Roundtable with author S.P. Huddleston. Steve, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you so much, Corey. It's an honor for uh, somebody to have this much interest in me, frankly. <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. I have a lot of interest in you and the new book that you have out, Fortune's Yoke. Steve, can you tell me all about this? Yes, sir. I should be able to, I think. It's an exploration, I would like to think, of the human condition. You know, I'm trying to uh, explore the Some myth kind of security in this mortal life exists or can be attained. Also exploring the idea of whether we really need to have security, mm. especially if we can't get it, which, you know, is another area of inquiry. But that's part of the human condition, isn't it? We really dapple with trying to come up with those answers. Now, it's nice to have a big, high, polluting sounding purpose to the book or intellectual exploration, but we've got to put some meat on it, don't we? Mm. With characters and a setting and a story. So I set my story in a place that was always intensely interesting to me and therefore made it easier, of course, to write about. But it's set in a place that few people know much of anything about beyond stereotypes of culture and uh, characterization of certain people. But very few people know the whole story. And I'm talking about what I would refer to as the dark and bloody grounds of the Appalachian coal field. It's an area populated by very interesting people. And uh, I think a reader would find them interesting. And I would perhaps hasten to point out that as quirky as some of them may seem, they're not atypical. Hmm. They're not unrealistic at all. So it's an interesting place, an interesting culture populated by interesting people and the type of place wherein these questions of the human condition, these dilemmas that we deal with, they frequently can arise. There's a lot going on there that brings these type of things into play, is what I'm trying to say. So it's a good ground to work in, I, I think. I hope people find it interesting. Hmm. Steve, what kind of people are those? Were you writing for a specific reading audience? I was not. I can't afford to be that picky, Corey. <laughs> How long did this whole process take you, Steve, from when you first sat down, started writing it, up until it was published? It took me three years to write the book. Well, that's just how long it took. For me, it was a process of thinking about it almost constantly. The writing of it is in fits and starts, kind of, because, as people say, today life gets in the way, doesn't it? I had to make a living. Mm. So it took three years, but, you know, I'm not sure I could have done it any, any more quickly, any better, anyway. Have you ever done anything like this before, Steve, written or been published? I have since. This was my first. Hmm. I've since had another compilation of short stories and a novella that are in print. I haven't sold any to speak of, but they're out there. But this novel, Fortune Joke, was my first effort. And I, and I, I will say this, it was an honest effort on my part to create literature. Hmm. So whether I succeeded is up to somebody else. But it was an effort. You know, it was a try. Steve, can you go back and think of what that spark was, that inspiration for you to say, hey, I'm going to write this book. i got to get this thing published. I knew you were going to ask that question, and <laughs> I'm not sure I have an answer. I've always admired writers and good writing. And I've always admired a good, effective use of the English language. Mm. So I would have liked to have considered myself somebody who could do that. And beyond that... To express myself in this way, I think I just, it's my own insecurity, probably. I was a younger man, and uh, I wanted to see if I could do this because I thought it was worth doing. Mm. And perhaps that was uh, giving myself a pep talk. It wasn't easy. You know, anybody's going to sit out to write. I don't know. Some people may find it easy. I, I always found it lonely. What was that day like when it finally came in the mail and you finally got to hold your first book for the very first time? It's a thrill, of course. You open it up, you want to see it. You want to look at it, you want to hold it, and yes, there's a sense of accomplishment. I would tell you, I would feel 
a process like this, at least with me, there are times when you almost begin to doubt that you're going to, you know, see this actually happen. Mm. So, yeah, it's a good feeling. Well, I think a lot of readers out there are really going to like this book, and I encourage my listeners to seek this out. Give it a shot. Again, the title is Fortune's Yoke. It's written by S.P. Huddleston, and it's published by Newman Springs Publishing. So, of course, you can get it everywhere, like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes, and also traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Well, Steve, I really appreciate you coming on the show tonight and telling me all about your work. I had a nice time chatting with you. Well, thank you. Like I say, it was a pleasure. Claws, Virus Age. It's the name of the new book written by Danae Story. And I get to find out all about this book. Danae is right here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Danae, welcome. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Nick. Can you tell me all about Claws, Virus Age? What can readers expect here, Danae? So I asked about a young man named Rats who gets turned into a monster when he goes to New York. And he, then he, later on, he rolls over New York and tries to get revenge on his father, Connor McAllister. What was the inspiration for this story? Can you think of what gave you the idea? Nothing. Uh, actually, it just happened on actually on the same month. It just sparked in, sparked in me like a plane. And just like they say, go with the flow like a river. And all <laughs> of a sudden, it just came to me. Hmm. When it comes to writing and being published and everything like that, Danae, have you done this kind of thing before or is this new to you? No. No, I have not. Well, congratulations. Uh, how long of a process was this for you to write, get published, have the audiobook produced and everything? Yeah, about a year. Yeah, took about a year. Of course, we're talking about the audio book, but first comes the hard copy of the book. And, Danae, when that finally came in, you got to hold it for the first time. What kind of moment was that like for you? Oh, unspeakable joy. That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> unspeakable joy. Mm, I bet. And so now that you've been through this for the first time, I'm sure that you learned an awful lot. What advice would you have for the aspiring authors who are listening to us right now? One simple thing. Hug God first. Nothing else. And can we expect maybe more from you in the future? Have you thought maybe about a sequel to Claws Virus Age? Or? Oh, yeah. I have a great in progress. Now, considering everything that went into this, Danae, what's the most rewarding aspect now of, of being a published author? Oh, just by filing along it to be published. That when I, when it, when I heard it first, I published, like I said, unspeakable joy. Mm. Who do you have in your life who inspires you, Danae, especially when it comes to this kind of thing you're writing? My mother. She was the one who was um, helping me get, you know, you know, helping to type in everything, you know, get published and everything. My mom. And when you sit down to write, you know, a lot of us sometimes we get writer's block. We really want to write, but the words aren't coming out. Does that happen to you, Danae? Oh yeah, yes it has. Every now and then, but then it, but then it, it comes back to me. Do you have a certain strategy to make those words come back to you? Like I said, just go with the flow. It just go like to the telephone God. It just comes to me, and whenever it comes to mind, I write it down. I don't waste a second. A lot of us authors, we also love to read. What kind of a reader are you, Danae? Spotify thriller, you know, action, drama, you know, something that everybody likes. And when you wrote Claws, Virus Age, how much of it did you pull out of your own life, out of your own personal experiences? Really, really nothing. You would do it. It's an idea that came. Nothing to do with really personal life. It just an idea that seemed interesting to me, and I put it on paper. When you write, uh, do you have a routine, maybe a certain time of day or a certain place that you like to write, or do you find yourself just writing whenever the ideas and the time are there for you? Just like so, but whenever it comes, if it comes at night, I'm running up night until like maybe one o'clock in the morning if I, if I get a chance. Mm. Now, when you sit down to begin a story like this, Danae, do you have an outline, like you know exactly how things are going to go from beginning to end, or maybe do you start with an idea and start writing and see where it goes? You know, like, like you said, start with an idea and see where it goes. You know, like I said, it just comes. And go with the flow. It doesn't come all at once, mind you, but it does come. And the cover can be a challenge to a lot of authors. You know, you're so concentrated on getting those words just right that you're not always thinking about what the cover's got to look like. Uh, what kind of a process was that for you, Danae? Was that difficult to decide? Well, yeah, actually, my, um, my people that would publish the book, they came up with the cover because I really did not have no, I could not draw claws, so they did their own idea, and I, and I approved of it. Now, Danae, we're talking about the audiobook edition of this. So what was it like for you whenever you heard the book, as opposed to reading it off the page? Well, it, it, was, it was really exciting. It was just, it was just it exciting just to write it. And when it finally was finished, I'm like, oh, thank God I'm done. <laughs> you know, then when it got published, I was on cloud nine. 
I think there are an awful lot of readers out there who are going to be into this book. Again, it's titled Claws, Virus Age. It's written by Danae Story, and it's published by the Audiobook Network, so go everywhere that you get your audiobooks and you can find this, like Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, everywhere. Danae, thanks again for coming on the show and telling me all about this. I had a nice time talking with you. And I hope you get a chance to read it yourself, too. You will not be disappointed. Thank you so much. I'm really happy that right now, here at the Reader House Author Roundtable, I'm joined by author Salok Ching. Salok, thank you so much for joining me here tonight. Oh, no problem. You have a new book out, and I just wanted to say congratulations. It's an audio book titled Yin Yang Relationships, Foundation of a Happy Family. Salok, can you tell me about this book? Yes, but before I talk about it, I just want to make a quote from a new book, okay? So, it is time is of the essence. Time passed by regardless when you do something productive or you do nothing unproductive. Life is all about making choices as you prioritize time in pursuit of happiness, memories you create for yourself and others, and the legacy you leave behind. Because in the end, that's what really matters. So with that being said, the yin-yang relationship is about how the four type of relationship, yin-yang, yang-yang, yang-ying, and yin-yang. Those are the four type of relationship. Basically, yin-ying is feminine-feminine relationship. Yang-yang, masculine-masculine relationship. And then the uh, yang-ying is women or masculine, men or feminine. So reverse. The only one relationship that would last is yin-yang. When women are feminine and men are masculine. And it's because women are now masculine, men are feminine. Now that is reversed now. And even the Bible and nature intended women supposed to be nurture, caretaker, and homemaker, staying at home. And men supposed to be the provider and protector, supposed to go out to work. And it is the United States propaganda, the government causes women to become men, to compete with men, and to prioritize work life instead of home life. Say, Lock, what inspired you to write this? What gave you the idea? How it inspired me is uh, when I watched a lot of YouTube video about relationship, and it's so logical about it, and then everybody's scratching their head, and it's complicated everything, you know? And they say, why is it so complicated? The hookup culture is started because women no longer have flexible hour anymore. They no longer are a homemaker and turn a house into a home anymore. They're competing with the men. So could you imagine creating a scarcity around the world? Now, every girl and boy are taught to go out and hustle to make a living so they can eat, okay? And they're telling the girl to go ahead and get an education Okay, and get a career to compete with the men. And in order for to have enough resources to have everybody, so you're telling a girl, you deserve your own house. Men, boys, you deserve your own house. You're the man of your house. Women are you, you're the man of your house. So everybody is a man of their own house. So can you imagine the United States have 333 million citizens that everyone deserves their own house? There is not enough resources to create for all those people because women cannot be submissive and follow. Even God they say that women supposed to submit to their husband. You see the problem? It creates scarcity. And now that you've been through this writing and publishing thing, Selah, do you have advice now that you could offer to the aspiring authors listening? Yes. Yeah. Don't be overwhelmed. In the high school, I hate reading and writing. I'm into mathematics. And so hate reading and writing is a subject that I don't really like. But when you think about the whole book in total, then you're going to overwhelm yourself. Just go through your regular life. As you think of something, then write it down right away. Don't wait on your cell phone. You know, your cell phone have those uh, notebook. Just go ahead and just type it down. You know what I mean? Write mm. it down, a sentence or two, and it will add up. Well, again, this book is titled Yin Yang Relationships, Foundation of a Happy Family. It's written by Say Lok Jing, and it's published by the Audiobook Network, so you can get it anywhere that you go to get your audiobooks. Go to Audible or the Apple iTunes Store or Amazon, and you'll be able to pick it up. 
Say, Locke, thank you again for coming on the Reader House off the roundtable and telling me all about this book. I had a really nice time talking with you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. I'm looking at a new book right now written by Mary Margaret Brown. It's titled, God Writes My Story. I get to find out all about this book. Mary is here with me now at the Reader House Author Roundtable. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for asking. Absolutely. Mary, can you tell me what you've written about in God Writes My Story? Well, I wrote about my experiences with meeting first the Holy Spirit. I didn't know he was the Holy Spirit when I was eight years old. Then two or three weeks later, I met Jesus at a country farm pond. Other than that, I didn't always follow the Lord. I was never really, I don't know what you'd call a great sinner, but later on when I was on my Damascus road, I met the Ancient of Days according to Isaiah 6. He came into my bookstore as a woman prayed for me, and I asked the same thing that Isaiah did. I said, put a coal to my lips because I'm a sinner. Then he blessed me, and the woman that was praying for me, she couldn't take her hands off my head. She said it was like a rock came down on it. She couldn't move, but she turned around, and her daughter was with her because she had stopped by. My bookstore hadn't opened. I was going to open it on Monday. This was Saturday night, and she turned around and hit her daughter on her forehead, and I saw her daughter's eyes clear up. You know, the eyes of the mirror of the soul. And I saw her eyes clear up. And her daughter went to church the following day and gave her heart to Jesus. So she said to me, as she shook her hand, she said, I've never experienced anything like that. What happened? And I thought she was going to say I had a demon, and I knew better than that. So I told her about what I had experienced. I saw the Ancient of Days come into that book. Door. It was in the basement of a garage that my mother and I owned. He came into the bookstore. He had snow white hair and beard. He didn't say anything, and I didn't either. I was standing, and I thought I would fall, but I couldn't. It would break the vision. So he came in and blessed me. That's my main experiences. I have also seen my guardian angels and some other angels that I write about in my book. Did this take you a long time to write and get published, Mary? Well, the first one was, God told me to write all of these books. I've written three. He told me to write each one of them. This was back in 2001. I put that together. I had several people helping me. None of us knew the computer or how to work or anything. And it went into 40 different countries and 60 different ministries. I was on a chat room, and people would come on, and we'd talk, and I'd send them the book. And I also ordained a man out of Pakistan to the United States, and he was in New York, and he asked me to come up and meet him. But anyway, that was the first book, which was on the glory road with God and his angels. Then I republished it in 2008, and both of those are on Amazon.com. In the meantime, I wrote a book on, God told me to write a book on women, and I researched that for about two years, and then I published it. It's called Arise, Daughter of Abraham, and then this one is my latest book, which the Holy Spirit helped me with this and pointed out things as you go along. You know, your first writing, you make a lot of mistakes, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you get a little bit better. Not that I'm the best, but I just do what the Lord tells me to do. Well, I think a lot of people are going to be blessed by this book. Again, the title is God Writes My Story. It's written by Mary Margaret Brown, published by Christian Faith Publishing. You can get it anywhere, like on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or iTunes or even traditional brick-and-mortar stores. Mary, thank you again for coming on the show tonight and telling me all about God Writes My Story and your other books. I had a nice time talking tonight. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, 
and triumphs of publishing their books. We hope to see you back here every Friday night at 8 p.m. or listen anytime via podcast at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, to name just a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.